names and schools or any details. Like it's enough that we know we come from the same area. Yeah, yeah I do. Right. He's a discussion. Oh, what city are you from? Yes. Yes. I'm Eva. We're Big looking to for a cause. Good evening. Good evening. Rather than frustrated. Oh, jeez. Like I said. The rule in the room is we don't give advice. Fine. But what about you? Have you been to my suicide chat rooms? Yeah. And do they help you? It's oh, enough that we know we come from the same area. Yeah, yeah, I do. He's a big cop. Yes. Yeah. 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 Who said I needed to be helped? Can I at least know your real name? You can call me Laura. Same area. Yeah, yeah I do. He's a big cop. Yes. I'm Eva. We're looking for cause. Good Hello? Anyone there? Are people still awake? Is this really the room known as Chiswick's bloody opinionated? We don't use our real names, names of schools, or any details like that. It's enough that we know we come from the same area. Right. I'll, I'll be Jim then. Hi Jim, I'm Eva. And I. Jack. William. So, what happens here? I haven't really been to this place before. What's up? He's a discussion, chit chat, bullshit. William wants to make a statement. If you have any causes handy, feel free. Can we talk about our problems here? Jim? Yeah? We are here to help you. Now, the second part of our show is a thing called Chat Room. Um, it's a really difficult piece, really challenging piece for, for young actors. It's a play about young people, performed by young people, but it's so difficult. Uh, there's a lot of laughs in it, there's a bit of tension, a bit of drama, but there's a very serious message behind it. So, um, I think they've nailed it, and they've worked so hard on this. There's just one slight change to your programme, if you have a programme. The girl playing the part of Emily, we had two girls to do that part. So tonight and tomorrow morning we have uh, Taras Gleeson playing the part of Emily. That's the only change. So I think we're ready to go. Um, enjoy. Thank you. Chocolate! But, but why make them dwarfs? 
Why the green hair? Why make them orange in the first place? Can you see where I'm going with this? Mm, kind of. What's wrong with the ordinary? It's for children. Ordinary is boring, maybe. Which is my original point about these children's authors. As if some, some little kid who shares a bed with his grandparents is ever in the real world going to win this extraordinary chocolate empire. Yeah. You know, in, in, in the real world, it would have been that fat German kid who falls in the chocolate lake and starts the tour. In the real world, he's the winner. I think I might have to... Here's how it really is. That kid falls in. His dad gets these big-time lawyers to sue the shit out of Willy Wonka. They look through his past, his very dodgy personal life with those orange dwarfs. He, they make shit out of him. His, his name is dragged through the tabloids, pedophilia ringing in his ears. He's doing 25 years in a medium security prison being passed around the inmates like a box of quality streets. And on the outside, the Germans win, because the Germans always win. Fat German kid, he, His name is Augustus. Right, Augustus. Well, he inherits everything as part of the settlement. Since he's such a fat fucking glut, he can't stop eating all the chocolate. The more the young bloke is made, the more he eats. He's 18 years old with 40 stone. One day he gets up, reaches for the TV room, and dies of massive coronary sclerosis. It's only a children's story. It's a lie. What's the point? What are they telling us? What are who telling us? Our parents, writers. Harry fucking Potter in the real world. He's still under the stairs. He's a thirty-year-old retard who developed his own under the stairs language. The point is. Yes. The point is. Is that children don't want to read the real stories. What child watches the news? It's just escape. Sometimes we have to dream of other things. Fuck off. Life's too short. If the world's gonna evolve in any way, children need to be told what's really happening. Cold, hard facts. That's what brought us down from the trees. That's what powers economy. Most of these stories are just metaphors. The writers are expressing important issues in creative ways. Expressing important? You see, you're depressing me again. Oh, fuck's sake. Do you really think any eight-year-old finished reading Charity in the Chocolate Factory is gonna think anything other than, gee, Granda, I love a never-ending gobstopper. Listen to me, John. It's Jack. They want to keep children young. They, they see children as a threat, so they don't want them thinking for themselves. They want to keep everything fantasy. This J.K. Rowling woman, she's the enemy. She should be taken out, removed, exterminated. So that's what you're doing in a Harry Potter chapter. Trying to draw up some interest in the assassination of J.K. Rowling. Well, are you interested? Oh, I can't. To do my job. I was younger then when she came on the scene, remember? Yeah. When I was like six, and that's a critical age. Of course. And you know that video with her and her pigtails and her school uniform? She looked lovely. You wanted to be her, didn't you? She didn't have her tits done then. That was much later. But even then they were a decent size. Definitely illegal. But at six, you wanted to be her. And wasn't that video a bit creepy? In hindsight, all that stuff that she was doing with her tongue it was all very sexual. We didn't notice because it wasn't for the kiddies. It was for the older boys and the daddies. Okay, anyway, so she has her pigtails and she's in her school uniform and she's doing that thing with her tongue. But it's something, you know, she's flicking it in and out like a little parrot. I mean, it was a good seat. And I'm watching it and I gotta say, I feel betrayed by Brittany. You know how all of her songs and her videos were like that journey from girl to woman? Yeah. And it felt good, didn't it? Like, Britney Spears is part of your puberty. Actually, I remember getting my first period, Miss Lita. I'm not a girl now, no, I'm a woman, and thinking, thanks, Britney, my sentiments exactly. She felt like a spokeswoman. Certainly. And as I watched Hit Me Baby one more time, and all that sexual stuff comes on, and just how cropped that crop top was, did she have her belly button pierced? Probably. Sorry, go on. It's no longer Britney talking to us but some pervert record producer with this vision, this plan to turn every single six-year-old girl in the Western world into some tongue-flicking, crop-top, belly-button-pierced temptress. Have you got your belly-button-pierced? Yeah, of course. Did it hurt? It's not as bad as you think, but anyway, Brittany. Brittany! Sorry, Brittany, go on. Don't you think those young girls started to feel that betrayal? Both of us did. Maybe that's why her career died so dead. You don't think it was to do with the fact that her music was shit? Well, maybe. And that basically she was a poor girl with no regard for money, and that's how she ended up being a single mother with fluctuating weight problems. But don't you think that these young girls knew that they had to take a stand against that pervert record producer? I don't, I don't really see the point. Brittany was thick. But she made her money. She lost our respect. If I met Britney Spears tomorrow, I'd go right up to her put my arms on her shoulders like I'm going to hug her, put my face up to hers like I'm going to kiss her, and whisper in her ear, Britney Spears, you sold my childhood soul. Oh, that's cruel. You sold my childhood soul and I'd smash her in the face. And what would Britney 
much of the color. The day of judgment will come with some teenage girl stops outside Burger King and says, Britney Spears, you sold my childhood soul, bitch. <laughs> okay, uh, I have to go. It's been nice talking to you, whoever you are. Well, can we talk some more? I had an argument with my bitch mother and I'm feeling terrible. Okay, what do you want to talk about? Murder. Yes. Gossless. 
I mean, I just hated her then. But anyway, in the passion play proper, in the following night, my mother walks up to the, uh, walks up to the stage as the Virgin Mary, and I still hate her from the previous night. There I am, kneeling to Jesus, looking up at him, and he's doing a wonderful job dying on that cross. That guy, Nick Lawson, I last saw him in, uh, I last saw him in the production of Aladdin, where he played the widow Twanky, and I swear to God he was hilarious. He was even better as Jesus Christ. Not in a hilarious way, but... I understand. Right. So, next line to my mother's woman. Behold your son. And I don't know whether it's Nick's delivery or my mother just being my mother, but I started to cry. I was crying really hard. Like, I completely upstaged Nick's crucifixion. The audience members are probably wondering if St. John was going to be alright and start to finish his gospel. But anyway, anyway, afterwards. My mother's over there at the San Christi, drinking our lemonade, and looking over at her, I didn't start to realize as to why I was getting upset in the first place. It was because I knew what my mother taught of me. So, if I seriously remind her of my dad walking out on her, then I should walk out on her too. But, where to? Where do I go to? The rule of the room is that we don't give advice. Alright, but what about you? Do you have anything to share? Maybe, but I just prefer to listen to other people's problems. Knowing that other teenagers are struggling with their problems probably helps you with yours, right? No. <sighs> These are very strange places, aren't they? Like I said, I don't know whether I should really be here or not, or whether it's that serious. I, I said... The rule in the room is we don't give advice. Fine. But what about you? Have you been to many suicide chat rooms? Yes. And do they help you? Who said I needed to be helped? Can I at least know your real name? Call me Laura. But is that your real name? <sighs> Maybe. What city are you from? It doesn't matter. None of this matters. What matters is that I'm at the other end and I'm here to listen to you. Is that not enough? I suppose. But can we talk about something else, Laura? I don't talk. I listen. You talk. Talk about what? Tell me, tell me about the day your father went missing. Six days and rested on the seventh. 
And I always saw the church as like a restaurant or a cafe that God would rest in. Or maybe a McDonald's? Exactly. And it was my duty as an angel waiter to serve him on his day off. So tell us, what does God eat? Chicken nuggets. I was only seven. That's very cute. How long did you think of this? Seven months. And the whole altar boy thing? Four years. Four years? Are you religious now? Uh, I'd rather not talk about religion. You either do or don't believe. End of discussion. Dick. We're all 15, 16, growing up in and around Chiswick to middle class families of varying wealth. I, I think we know each other's opinions on boring issues like religion. Oh, really? And what's mine? You're disillusioned with the official church, and yet you've remained spiritual and have defined your own personal religion based on the simple idea that people should be nice to each other. Cliche. We're all cliches. Yeah. Everybody can be put into little boxes like that. They can. So what are you? Uh, pain in the arts. Apart from that. I'm a cynic. I'm an angry cynic. Well, that's attractive. I'm not interested in being attractive. Why should I be? Um, because attractive people go further. Oh well, yeah, I, I think I glanced at that article in one of my sister's magazines. People see a cynic as a black hole. They're nothing. Or someone who might be attractive or charming. Well, they're at the very centre of things. They manipulate things and they change things. What are you but a bad smell? That's very kind of you. You know what I mean. You think I'm heavy-handed? You certainly sound that way. He's bloody opinionated. Well, that's the name of the room, isn't it? Chiswick's bloody opinionated. Jesus Christ. I'm at the age, we're all at the age, where we need to stand up for something. It's not about making friends and going bowling, bumming cigarettes at McDonald's and talking about the latest on Fly LP. That's a waste of fucking time. Now's the time to step away from other people and be an arsehole. Being a teenager used to mean something. It used to be about rebellion. Apart from the punks, what have teenagers achieved in the last 30 years? Nothing. Um, did the punks achieve something? They made their mark. They were angry and they showed it. My mother was a punk. We've got this picture from her from 1979. She's got a course on her cheeks like a tennis ball. Quite amazing. <coughs> it was dirty work being a punk. See, nowadays, teenagers wouldn't go that far before cracking open their clenches. Ugh, definitely. I'm not so sure about that. I had a boil on the back of my neck last year, and my mother brought me to the doctor. But I was absolutely gutted when he said he wouldn't lance it. Aww. Well, he gave me this small black plaster with a tiny hole in the middle. Sort of draws the pus out towards the small hole. So, I was sitting there, with my dad and my baby brother watching the television and above the telly I hear this noise. <coughs> I swear to God it hit the wall behind me. That is disgusting. But it was a revolution. How? My body was revolting. Oh, the comedy. But does anybody know what I'm talking about? Not reading. Yeah, I do. Finally. Once I went on an anti-war march for like an hour and while I was there I felt like really good and empowered. But I guess it was just one hour of my life saying that I actually believed in something. Oh yeah. I guess the rest of them were just, you know, like sleepwalking and waiting for something to happen instead of actually letting it happen. It would be nice to have a cause, a statement. When you must to assassinate J.K. Rowland? I was only joking. You talked about it for about an hour in the Harry Potter chat room last week. It's not her, it's the idea of her, it's what she stands for. <laughs> Which is what exactly? William believes that children's writers simplify everything to keep children simple. They see children as a threat. Who do? Adults. It's, it's like the adults support these writers to write these pointless stories of fantasy so that kids have this cutesy warped idea of what life is like. So, J.K. Rowling is the field marshal? She's the enemy, not her, but the idea of her. If I could kill the idea of her without killing her, I'd do it tonight. Are you actually a lunatic? I, I just want to do something important. It's frustrating. Well, would you ever kill anything, William? No. I, anyone can kill someone. Where's the glory in that? Aren't you supposed to say that every life is sacred? Exactly. That's crap. There's some people in life's wasted on Racists. Dictators, terrorists, PE -E teachers. <laughs> they suck the goodness out of it. Like William. Shut up, Jack. I think William just wants a cause and he wants to see that cause through. He wants to make a big statement. 
Right, William? Yes, exactly. I want to make a big statement. It doesn't. Thanks, Steve. It's Eva. Right, e Eva. Hello? Anyone there? Are people still awake? Is this really the room known as Chiswick's Bloody Opinionated? We don't use our real names, names of schools, any personal details. It's enough that we know we come from the same area. Right. I'll be Jim then. Hi Jim, I'm Eva. Emily. Jack. William. So, what happens here? I don't actually know this place. What's up? He's a discussion, chit chat, bullshit. William wants a cause. We're all a bit frustrated. If you have any causes handy, feel free. Can we talk about our problems here? <laughs> oh god. Have you got problems, Jim? Well, yeah, yeah, I do. Are they big problems? Yeah, but big to me anyway. And you want us to listen to these problems, maybe give you a bit of advice. Oh, Jesus, will you? <laughs> Are you still there? Look, I'll go to another room if you want. Jim? Yes? We are here to help you. So, I've been bullied through primary and now through secondary school. People have been calling me skinny and very funny looking, so it goes with the territory. And I've been having these, uh, these worries, like very deep worries. And most recently, I have been feeling a bit like, what's the point? What's the point in anything? Not in a morning teenager way. Your depression isn't potential. What do you mean? You're genuinely depressed. 100% genuine. I, I'm not one of these people who keeps an altar to Kurt Cobain or anybody like that. I actually cannot stand Nirvana. Like, I don't need our music to like feed my depression. I can happily do that all by myself. Well, obviously not happily. Yeah, yeah. Happily's not the right word, but you know what I mean. What does depression feel like? Oh, it feels great. What the fuck do you think it feels like? No, I know it's bad, but I just wanted to know how it felt for Jim. Well, Jim? It's like the whole world has turned into soup. Everything just has the consistency of soup, and that your lungs, as well as your heart, just sort of, well, ache. And it's like my life has been blocked by just five slope, uh, sliced loaves of bread. It's exactly like that. Wow. Depression is like bread soup. Oh, shut up, Jack. I was only repeating. The food comparison probably doesn't work. Well, schizophrenics often say they feel like a mixed salad. You sound sweet. Do you have a girlfriend? Uh, hold on a minute now. We're, we're trying to give Jim some advice. I know. I'm just wondering if you can't talk to any of your family members. You know, maybe an understanding girlfriend would have... Jesus you. Christ, Emily. If you've been listening for the last half hour, you wouldn't have asked that. Jim doesn't have our normal teenage problems. They can't be solved by a quick feel behind the chip shop. I think he's different. Yeah, of course he'd love a boyfriend, but, but that can't happen right now. But that can't happen right now, because he's too busy worried about getting out of bed in the morning, facing one of his shitty days. I'm not that bad. Can you think before you speak, Emery? Oh, piss off! No, this is bullshit. I expected more from you. You didn't strike me as some head in the sand princess. I'm not like that! Selfish cat. Jesus Christ, all I said was that... Jim... Jim has the courage to come in here and talk about all this pathetic crap, and, and all you have to do is imagine that for a minute someone could be different from you. You have no idea what I'm like. <laughs> well, by a comment like that, that Jim could be cured by the heart of a good girl. I didn't mean it that way. Sorry about this, Jim. I think you've no. got a really good impression of what type of girl you are, Emily. Fuck off. Living in a little suburban bubble, small group of girlfriends, hang out after music lessons, sniggering over copies of Cosmo. They're all called Sarah, right? Sarah Ann, Sarah Louise, Sarah Marie, Sarah Jane. The hair band brigade with your lacrosse shirts and your deck shoes. What's the worst that's happened to you? Oh, come on, guys. Scuffed chinos in the park. That night Daddy didn't pick you up for pizza and you'd get the bus home. Or maybe it was when your pony had to be put down because your big fat crappy arse was bumping its back. I have anorexia, you know. So what? Weekend anorexia, was it? Forcing out of those chinos had to shift a few pounds. What? Anorexia is a stat symbol for a girl like you. You wear your six months anorexia like a badge of honor. You think it gives you an edge? It makes you a stereotype. So that's why when people talk to you about their problems like depression, you can battle aside with all that shit about 
Oh, if only you had a girlfriend, you'd be feeling a lot better. Christ, if we let you drone on, you'd see you cheer up Charlie. Turn the chocolate factory, I hate that fucking film. Get out of here, Emily. We want people who are here for Jim. I am here for Jim. People who understand his problems and get the cause. Oh, what? Jim's your fucking cause now? We're here for him 100% on a 24 hour call. He's feeling cut up over something. We're here to listen to him and advise him. Understood? That's right. Jim doesn't need any chat. He doesn't need some ex anorexic pony rider spurting little TV digest sound bites. Put simply. Piss off. She gone? Hardly matters. City cow. Well, maybe she did not mean what you think. Jim, you don't have to defend her. She's not needed. Anorexia is terrible. God, forget about her. She's debris. We want people who are here for Jim. What about you, Jack? Yeah, I suppose. Wonderful load of confidence there. How about a little more conviction, funny man? Well, no offense, Jim, but we're your age. Shouldn't you be going to, like, a doctor or something about this? Well, I was Christ, a- Jack, why are you so fucking cruel? Don't you get it? He doesn't have anybody. We're all he has. I was only saying- Jack! Can we step into Kylie's chat room quickly? I want to talk to you in private. That was weird. Forget about it now. Well, why don't you tell me about the day your father went missing? Well, okay, but like, shouldn't I wait for the two boys to come back first? I'll give them my notes. Okay. Alright. I was six years of age, and my mother, as well as my three brothers, were going out uh, for the day. Uh, so that means I have to like stay behind with my father. My mother tells me that like it's the perfect time for us to bond together for once. Then as they leave, me and my dad were just staring across from each other over a table as if we met each other for the first time. Then my dad asks me what I wanted to do. And so I tell him that I wanted to go to the zoo and see the penguins. I was a big penguin fanatic. I would even like uh, go to restaurants and order fish fingers and everything like that. And if it wasn't penguins, <coughs> it was cowboys. Cowboys were cool. A penguin dressed up as a cowboy was always a bit too much, believe it or not. Oh my god. So, I get my cowboy hat and my holster, and uh, me and my dad go out to get a bus. We get on the bus. And it's very strange to see uh, my dad actually sitting beside me for once. Uh, then we started having a chat on the bus about like how big of a baby I was when I was very little. <sighs> Those were the times. So, uh, we make it to the zoo and uh, I see the penguins and I feel very happy about it. And I would always just like waddle with them, just uh, have myself a bit of fun. Then me and my dad would like sit, uh, sit with each other at a nearby bench, and we would talk to one another. And then he just lets go of my hands, and he tells me that he's just going to like get me a chalk ice, and that he will be right back. Well, I wait for him, and I wait for him, but he didn't return. So then, like. I'm not scared just yet, uh, so I decided to like look around uh, at the zoo just to see if he was there, and he wasn't. Then I decided that like if he wasn't uh, there at the zoo, then maybe he's there at home. So I patiently went to the bus uh, and got on it, and I asked the driver to take me home, and the driver tells me, or asked me really, where are your parents, young man? And then I told uh, the, the bus driver that like, my parents are home. So I sit very close to the bus driver and I get, I get off the bus a few minutes later. And so like, I get the key from under the mat and then I open the door and I hang out my hat and holster. And closing the door, I then, real, uh, I then saw that like, there was like absolutely no one there. It was all so spacious. So I got into my pajamas, got my milk and biscuits, and I started watching Stars in Their Eyes on the telly because that was my dad's favorite show at the time. And then I realized that I was getting a bit too spacious and I was getting pretty nervous. So 
I decided to get my duvet and head into the bathroom where I could feel more like, you know, compacted uh, and safe as well. So I wait for uh, my dad in there, but he doesn't come back. I even like wait there for like two days and he doesn't come back. Jack, it'll be a laugh. Right now we're, we're all he has. We're there from 24-7. He even gets it. Why can't you? He's, he's our cause. Let's just let him talk a little. Mess him up a bit. See how far he'll go. Are you there, Jack? Are you with the cause, Jack? What next? Chat. And then, like Chad and the others in the suicide club, 
You reach a moment of recognition. You're searching for that elusive purpose. A purpose. Right. A purpose? Fuck 15 years. It's so depressing. If it wasn't such a tragic life story, it would have made it into a funny musical. You know, I don't think you've ever been given a chance. For some reason, it always seems to be you who gets burnt, Jim. But why me? You can't take responsibility for what other people have done to you or other people think of you, Jim. The reason why people do these things isn't because of something that they have control over. Why me? It's a stupid question. Right. What you're Sorry. feeling right now, this moment, that's what's important. Concentrate on that. But, try and be more positive. Shut up, Jack. Oh, but fuck it, guys. All this talk. Jack! No! This is bullshit! You're just highlighting all this shit that's happened to Jim. Jim, listen to me. Things have been hard. I can see that. You don't care about Jim. I care. Why don't you tell him what you told us earlier? What are you talking about? Go on. Be honest. Tell him. Tell him, Jack. What did you say, Jack? I didn't say anything. What are you on about? When we told Jack about how your dad left you when you were little, he laughed. From the very outset, he's been saying that you're nothing but a spoiled brat who needs a beating. Can't be trusted, Jim. He's one of those hard-working lower-class types. He's not even from Chiswick. He's a Brixton boy or something. Apple of his mother's eye. Makes himself out to be everybody's friend. He's a backstabbing bastard. Fuck off! There's nothing worse than someone ashamed of their background, is there, William? Some eager beaver affecting a voice to get on in life. Oh, Jesus. Sitting around the dinner table, looking at all those dumb faces, talking about stupid shit, shut up family life. Can't you see him? Little Lord Fauntleroy of Stockwell, stuck up in his room, dreaming of escape. If he thinks that about his family, then friends must mean shit. Jack's not got friends. It's all virtual, right? Kind of people seeing what he really is. You said that, Jack? No, I didn't! What does Jim mean to the superior Jack, I wonder? Whinging twerp. A middle class quack? Godless, gibbering child. One of life's morons. Spoiled imbecile. A molly called spastic. Jim, please shut up, Jack. No, but this is Jack. You worthless piece of shit. Why don't you take your snobby and leases arse and fuck off back downstairs to an evening of Pringles and Sky One? Too good. Oh, fuck! Sorry I had to hear all that, Jim. It's just that he seemed like a really nice guy. No, and you think you know a guy. Go on, Will. Jim. I'm listening. You need to channel your anger to something that'll get back all those people in your past. What do you mean? How do you think that you could make your mother feel all of that pain that she made you feel all of those years that she neglected you and treated you like nothing? Well, I have been fighting my mother for a long time. But she doesn't listen, does she? No, she does not. It doesn't even make me feel any better. So? I wish that I could have just done something, like for her to go up to my room and see me dead by either like cutting my wrists or eating some pills or something like that. I could only just imagine her face. Bitch. She'd be crushed. Guilt would kill her. Yeah, it would. Jim, me and Eva can't possibly imagine what your life is like. It just seems so sad. Without hope, probably. But we've been giving up our time recently and been listening to you, haven't we? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, thanks, lads, really. I, I just want you to do one thing for me, Jim, all right? Yeah, anything, William. Anything. I want you to ask yourself two questions before you go to bed. Do you have a pen and paper to write them down? Yeah, yeah. Give me a second. Uh, oh.
last thing he needs is some strangers giving their half arts opinions about the matter. Believe me, it doesn't help. But you might be able to help him. Look, all I do is talk to kids who have these urges to hurt themselves. That's it. Sometimes they don't even do it. They just feel or actually don't have anyone they can talk to. That's all I do. But the only two people he has are two strangers who are trying to make him do something to himself. I don't go into other rooms, okay? Too much shit happens in there. People get hurt. Exactly the reason why we want you to intervene. Christ. If you want to pass on my email to him, it's Lord Petito. Oh, God. Fuck that. Like, you don't actually have to talk to him. Just go in and see what it's like. If it gets too much, you can always back out. We'll be right there with you. But who are you? How can I know I can trust you? Jesus, my name is Emily. I started a school in club called Mathematics, the Brainiac, Mathematics Club. I've never so much as looked at a boy, and I'd love nothing more than to be able to get out of his hideous body, and to be able to forget the difference between fucking natural and unnatural logarithms. Emily? No. Last night, I had a dream, and I think I experienced my forced orgasm, and I swear, all I can remember from the dream is asking Stephen Hawking asked me to change his batteries. Listen, Laura, I'm a trustworthy person. You can trust me. But what we need to do now is get our head out of our fucking arses before something bad happens. Are you there, Laura? <coughs>
recently I haven't really been uh, that used to like urban spaces, so I think I am better off doing it here. But do you have a webcam to broadcast it? My brother Jonathan has one. Perfect. But here's the thing, he would absolutely kill me if he saw me using it. We wouldn't want that, would we now? It would sort of steal your thunder. Yeah, it, it would. Jim, this is Laura. I'm sorry, who the hell are you? She came in with us. I've spoken with Jim before we know each other. You're a friend of his? Why exactly are you harassing him like that? We're here for him. Do you have any idea what state he's in? I know he's not feeling well. What? He's not feeling good about himself. He's lonely. He feels detached. He's suicidal. He's ready to take his own life. Which is what you want! Piss off, Jack. Why are you doing this? We're his friends. We're, we care about him. No, you don't. You're not his friends. We didn't abandon him like you two. Jim came to us looking for advice. We've been making things clear for him. You're talking to him like there's no other options. Like there's nothing else. Suicide is just some sort of romantic gesture. Like, it'll make a big statement for all those trapped average teenagers. Like the death of one 15-year-old will be held up by other 15-year-olds. If you think of yourself as this blob that can mold themselves into the mind of this trapped child and set them on a set pattern for life, if you think that, it will happen. It will happen. Choices are made and choices will be made where you have no control. Your life is set. That shit. Every single moment in life there's possibilities. Bitch. The statement being made is yours, but what exactly are you saying, William? That you've got power? That you're smart enough to back this vulnerable kid into a corner where he might kill himself? And this is just a big joke to you two, isn't it? One big comedy. And it's easier than murder, isn't it? Because you don't have to look a dead boy in the eyes, because you can't see him, it's easier. But you know what? It's just like murder. In these rooms, words have power. And you and that bitch have all the right words! Eva, come on! You know what? Fuck this. You've tried to kill yourself and chicken now, haven't you? You think I'm gonna let Jim be lectured by some, some new age happy clappy princess? You're wrong. Jim has real problems. This isn't a competition about who's the most sad here, William! And if you do need to know, dick! I have tried to kill myself, I did slip my wrist, and it did come from a very real place. But you know what? I'm happy I'm alive. And yes, some days are better than others, and yes, some days are a struggle, but I like the struggle. I like it a lot more than being six feet underground, looking down on all the family and friends I torn apart. Stay alive, and they can help me. There's always a life. You're one of those Sad girls who sits in suicide chat rooms just listening to other people's stories, soaking up their sorrow. What statement are you making, bitch? You you talk about a life of love, choice, possibility, happiness, but but I bet you love nothing more than a world of morose, sad 15-year-olds draining on about their problems. Why not support those who want to kill themselves? Why not allow them to do it? They're like the front lines, aren't they? Like the, the public face of our gloom, printed in the papers, shown on the telly. Why not? Why not support them to do the brave thing, do the decent thing? To get rid of the chap and make way for a true rev revolutionary teenager. So next time, do the decent thing. Don't call for mummy and daddy, just fucking do it! Stop! I'm 15 and I'm allowed to do whatever I want as I please! I must live in the same area. Tomorrow at 1, meet me on the high street at Jumbo's. And I want you all to be there because I can't live in my room anymore! Sure, I may do it quietly, but I want you to see me do it. Jim, I'm still here to talk to you. You know what? I've got enough of this talking. Let's finish this.
funny, but I slept well. Probably the best sleep I've had in months. I left the house with my bag full of stuff, and there was no one there. My mother was working her shift in the petrol station, and my brothers were at this American wrestling thing that was happening at Earl's Court. I got the bus, and there was this man with his son, which got me thinking about me and dad, and the zoo, and the cowboy outfits, and all that. Seemed appropriate that I would see them. Typical. In the bus, I started to think about all those thousands of teenagers who kill themselves every year. Somebody would be killing themselves right now, maybe, while a number of others would have had this planned out. Uh, And a lot of them are doing this because they really are very ill, and some are doing this because they're alone. Or maybe they're sad because someone hurts them somehow. There are so many reasons to do it. And I started thinking about all the families and friends who were left behind and the regrets that must eat them up. It's all so quiet and violent. I got off the bus and walked through the streets and imagined all the ghosts of the dead teenagers looking at me. And what were they thinking? And what would they say to me? It's like they all follow me down the high street and into jumbos. And they watch me buy some chicken wings and a coke and find a table. In this room, those angels are waiting for me. And I don't see myself as anything other than me. I don't imagine what I'm about to do is making a big statement or speaking out for millions of teenagers, I'm alone. There's no questions, but I've been very sad about things, and I'm probably like thousands of teenagers who get depressed. But I had to do something for me. I had to grow up fast when my father left, and it's as simple as that. And I really miss him, and I can't understand why he's gone. Something that simple can mess you up for a long time. When you're six and wearing a cowboy outfit and looking at the penguins, you shouldn't be made to grow up so fast. But I was, and I tore myself up over it for years and I tried to find the answers. But honestly, what can a child do? I just want my childhood back.